Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. Welcome to you in the sanctuary, and welcome to everyone who's joined us on Zoom. My name is Lynn Turvey. My pronouns are she, her, and I will be your service leader this morning. I am joined by our minister, Reverend Rosemary Morrison. <laughs> Thank you so much to our tech team and to our Zoom support people who uh, make it possible for this hybrid service to take place. And I just want, this wasn't in my little script thing, but I just wanted to, when I look out here at the sanctuary and the way it's so nicely organized and we've come here to, to enjoy this service, and then reflecting how last night at the Corey Alice Fundraiser Cabaret was completely different. It was transformed into this beautiful musical venue. It was so enjoyable, wonderful music. And if you weren't there, don't forget to come next year when we have it, because it was really good. And we're so fortunate to have a place like this that we can hold these kinds of things in our community. As Unitarian Universalists, we are bound together not by a common set of beliefs, but by our promise to support one another in our individual searches for truth and meaning, guided by our principles and drawing from many sources. We begin our gathering acknowledging that we are located on Treaty 6 territory. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Uh, Karen, I believe, has an announcement. She's left. So I'm just going to build on Lynn's um, message that last night was a fantastic night. Um, there were a couple moments where I just thought they were transcendent. It was The music was just so amazing. And it was so great to have people back gathered together again for live music. And so we've left on a few of the cabaret touches in the trees so you can all enjoy that this morning. Um, I also wanted to pass along a very heartfelt thank you to the volunteers who helped make it possible and to share that we um, netted about just over $1,200. And there's an opportunity this morning, here comes the sales pitch, um, <laughs> to up that just a little bit because we did have some leftover uh, wine and some other beverages and so I'll just be kind of at the back corner after the service and if you would like to take some of that home for a contribution, we can up that figure even more. David, go first. Yeah. Okay, from the uh, good news to the bad news. Uh, some of you will have been in the service previously where we were announcing a play, um, Park Bench with View, that we would be putting on by the end of uh, April. Unfortunately, um, we got covid uh, This seems to be happening. Um, we had one member went off of the cast, went off to uh, Hawaii, came back with uh, three COVID cases in the family. She unfortunately was a prime actor in the show. Uh, we waited the mandatory uh, wait period. She showed up for the next rehearsal and then the next day came down with some massive attack of something. Um, over the weekend we followed it and we, the committee, the management committee, felt there was no way we could be sure that we could put the show on. Um, felt pretty lousy about this. Uh, however, I was picking up vibes that um, jubilations dinner theater was having the same problem and then our agent in uh, Mayfield dinner theater who was also our costumer uh, said that they were having several actors and, ca and crew down with COVID 
And uh, just a day or so ago, Roxy Theater, newly reopened after disaster fire, disastrous fire, had to shut a show down. So we don't know what's going on, but unfortunately we had to close and feel lousy about it. We'll keep you posted. Thank you. That's too bad, Dave. We look forward to when you can bring the play to us in the future. Good morning. Good morning. Let's, uh, let's try that again. <laughs> we, can, you can, we, we can do better. Good morning. Good morning. Excellent. That's so nice. Welcome. My name is the Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and it is my pleasure and honor to serve this congregation. Um, I'd also like to welcome everyone here in person, on Zoom, and in the future, if you watch on YouTube later on. Um, I just had so much fun last night, so I want to thank the, the uh, organizers and everyone that was here um, for, for the show last night as well. And it can continue. These wonderful good feelings can continue. So tomorrow evening, um, if you would like to come to Brewster's in uh, Unity, is that what it's called? Unity Square. Unity Square. I'll be there, you know, for if you want to come for dinner, uh, come around 6.30 if you like. I'm going to be there from about 6.15 on, so please come and join uh, your fellow congregants uh, for just a, a fun, relaxing evening of, um, beverage of your cho beverages of your choice, a meal if you like, and just some good company. Um, some good conversation. Um, Easter Sunday. The staff and I have kind of a good idea. Well, we think it's a good idea. I hope you do too. So we're going to have an Easter Sunday service. And then we sort of thought, because people really like to get together for food and fellowship after church, we thought it might be a nice time to do a soup Sunday. But we need some help for that and also our um, our lovely Oksana Atwood has the skills to teach us how to do the Ukrainian Easter eggs so we are going we've ordered the supplies we've got enough for 20 25 people and so Easter Sunday pull out all the stops for Easter Sunday service then we'll have a soup Sunday and then decorating Ukrainian Easter eggs which are called it starts with a P Pisanka. Okay. I am not from Edmonton, so. All right, so if anybody is willing to help me, now actually, I'm going to rephrase that. If anyone is willing to coordinate, I'll just hand it to you, a soup Sunday for Easter Sunday, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so we ask that you quiet any devices you may have brought with you, and we'll create a space in this hour just to be together in life and love. Now let go of the everyday world, and, we'll, and uh, enjoy a time of contemplation and music as we listen to a prelude by Karen Mills, There Are Such Things. Thank you so much, Karen. I now invite Gerard Haydock to come forward to light our chalice while I read these words 
by Reverend Scott Taylor. We light this chalice for those who convinced us that it was safe to share our longings, for those who proved that not everyone will run from the weight of the pain we carry, for those who held us in our fear and helped us heal from our regret, for those whose humble apologies made us believe that we too could be forgiven, and for those whose tenderness helped us to see that we no longer need to hide. Our vulnerability frees us, it binds us, it makes holy the path we travel together. May this flame ever help us keep that in view. Our opening hymn is hymn number 38, Morning Has Broken. Please rise as you are willing and able. The words will appear on the screen behind me and you can find them in the gray hymnal as well. One of the purposes of this church community is to encourage all gather here to grow more generous in spirit and action. It's so important for this self-supporting church and its many ministries. In addition to supporting this community, we also make a monthly contribution, a commitment to the wider community. One half of the unidentified cash received is given to an outside organization. For the month of March, we are supporting the International Convocation of Unitarian Universalist Women, a nonprofit organization in special consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council, focusing on global women's rights and empowerment. And as the offering plates are, are being passed around, I invite Andrew Mills to come forward and talk about Canvas. Good morning, my name is Andrew Mills and I have the pleasure of being the treasurer of this church. I'm also the canvas guy. I have done canvas for a lot of years now. I think this is my 14th year. And um, canvas is the time of year when we go out to everybody and ask uh, when, what you're thinking of contributing next year. So if you're a member of this church, you need to return a pledge and give us an indication of what you think you will contribute next year. Now, friends, if you're friends of the church and not a member, uh, that's not a requirement. Um, any donations that the friends of the church give are absolutely wonderful. But members, we do have an expectation that you will financially support this church. If you actually look at the covenant that we have built, it actually says that we will share our gifts, both of time and finances. And that's part of being part of this church, to be a member, to be in that covenant, to be part of what's going on. Today's the last day. So if you haven't pledged yet, 
please grab a pledge form. Jan has them there. Uh, just put your hand up if you didn't get one coming in. Uh, if you haven't returned one, today's the day. Uh, tomorrow I'll be doing my major budget uh, discussions and this is how we will actually, uh, one up here please Jen, um, one up here. Um, tomorrow we're going to start our budget discussions, right up in front. Um, we're going to start our budget discussions and I have to put together a budget to say how are we going to fund this church for the coming year. So we need to raise about $160,000 from donations. We have 140 members, so as I said uh, a couple weeks ago, that's $1,142 per person, per member, per member, uh, that has to be uh, raised. So I have to know whether we got there or not. Now, if you're on ongoing monthly donations and you didn't put in a pledge, we will roll that monthly donation over into the coming year. So we will see that. But it would be great to get a pledge from uh, people who are ongoing monthly donors so that we we get the confirmation that you're still, uh, you're still with us, that you're still keen to support us. That would be very affirming for us and we would like to see that. So today's the day. Please pledge generously. Please uh, help support the work of this church. And uh, that way I'll be able at the annual general meeting to stand up and say, hey, this is how much money we've raised for next year. This is how much money our members are gonna put forward to keeping our church running. Thank you all very much. We'll now sing from you, I receive. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. So I have divided the message this morning into two parts. And this morning, when you're the minister of a church and it's canvas time, you have to do a sermon on, we call it in, the, in this business, we call it the sermon on the amount. <laughs> this is my sermon on the amount this morning. And remember last week I said I was going to make it fun? Do you remember that? Yeah, I lied. <laughs> so, in this first part, so I've decided, I've divided the sermon into two parts. So this per first part, I'm going to talk about canvas and stewardship and how we can deepen our relationship with this congregation through our gifts. And I've learned a lot about generosity from the book, The Generosity Path. Finding the Richness in Giving by Mark Ewart. One of the things I really like about this book is that there's these little sidebars, the little, little quotes in boxes. I don't know about you, but often when I'm reading a book, that's the only part of the book I actually read. And so I've, I'm going to give you some of those little sidebars this morning as, as my text for this. And the first one is by the Lama Surya Das, who is quoting the Buddha. Giving brings happiness at every stage of expression. We experience joy in forming the intention to be generous. We, in, we experience joy in the actual giving of something. And we experience joy remembering the fact that we have already given. Henry Nowen says, Every time I take a step into the direction of generosity, I know that I am moving from fear into love. Deepak Chopra. Giving connects two people, the giver and the receiver, and this connection gives birth to a new sense of belonging. Parker Palmer. In the human world, abundance does not happen automatically. It is created when we have the sense to choose community, to come together to celebrate and to share our common story. Lilla Watson. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let's work together and Maya Angelou. 
One isn't necessarily born with courage, but one is born with potential. Without courage, we cannot practice any other virtue with consistency. We can't be kind, true, merciful, generous, or awesome. Oh, honest. And we can't be awesome either. <laughs> So when I was doing my internship in Kelowna, my internship supervisor was the Reverend Karen Fraser Gitlitz. How many of you know Reverend Karen? She's the minister in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And so when Canvas Time came along during my internship, she was very helpful to me and the congregation. And she said, people give to a vision, not a budget. The budget's important. Sorry, Andrew. They need to see what is in store for them. They need to understand why it is in their best interest to pledge to the congregation. So what's the vision? And, and I personally find this is true. I don't give to organizations that I don't have some kind of idea of where they are headed, or what their mandate is, or what good they are doing in the world. UCE has a mission statement, which is basically the same thing as a mandate. And I'll quote it for you. UCE's mission is to inspire social justice by questioning the status quo, engaging community, and inviting all to the table. We do this by providing an intentionally inclusive home to nurture spiritual growth and transformation, foster learning opportunities and outreach experiences, welcome all age groups, support action for social justice, and be guided by the principles and sources of Unitarian Universalism. And we have a vision. We open doors to all seekers of spiritual growth and nurture positive change for a just and healthy world. Let's break this down a little, shall we? So, and first of all, let's talk about UCE's vision, because after all, Reverend Karen is right. People support a vision with their time, talent, and money. We open doors to all seekers of spiritual growth. We open doors to all seekers of spiritual growth. Can we say it together? We open doors to all seekers of spiritual growth. So first of all, we need to have a place where we can live out our vision, where we can actually open the doors. And UCE has created such a place, a wonderful home with beautiful space for gathering. There were some clever folks who decided to have a commercial property as part of the plan. They pay quite a bit to, to keep the doors open. And coincidentally, our current renters are called open doors. Who knew? It's pretty clever. They don't pay everything, of course, only some. So we've got open doors in reality. We're keeping our church, our home, clean, inviting, in good repair. And we also have open doors metaphorically. We welcome folks that might not have felt welcome in other places. Folks that identify with one or more of the plethora of identities contained in the acronym LGBTQ+. People with disabilities, minorities, and different levels of everything that, keep, that people keep track statistically and things that are measured. And so kind of includes us all, doesn't it? There's a lot of learning for us to be truly welcoming. And we are learning how to use pronouns properly, to not be judgmental, act friendly, but not too friendly, if you know what I mean, and generally encourage people to be who they are. In other ways, we are open-hearted as well. We, op we rent out our spaces to many and varied groups. And sometimes I'll be here and people have come, that may be a, a meeting, and people say, find out that I'm here and that I'm the minister, and they'll say, you know, we love coming here because we feel so welcome. 
We feel like we can just be ourselves. We love the signs on the walls and your values. So, in a way, having people come here for their meetings where maybe they wouldn't be welcome in other spaces, that in itself, just in itself and nothing more, if we just take, took nothing more into account, that is social justice. That is living out our principles. But we can't do it if we don't have our doors open, now can we? The other and more important part is to think about how pledging is also tied to our mission. UC's mission statement is to inspire social justice by questioning the status quo, engaging community, and inviting all to the table. And we do this through many means. Nurturing spiritual growth, fostering learning opportunities, welcoming all age groups, and supporting social justice and living out our values. If we are to truly live into what you collectively have said that you want, not only do we have to have the doors open, we have to have programs that foster spiritual growth. It's right there in our mission statement. We have to have outreach opportunities. Welcoming all age groups is more than just saying, come on down, join us. We actually have to have something meaningful for them to do. There's a bit of a joke. I lived in Indiana for three years. It was a very interesting experience. And one of the jokes about Indiana, it says, um, and it's kind of, picture this on a billboard with, you know, cornfields in the background. And uh, it said, says, come to Indiana. Bring something to do. We do not want to be like Indiana, I can tell you that. So if we wish to live into our vision, we can't just say, let's open our doors and look after our building. We have to support programming. In my humble opinion, putting on events and having excellent programming or in church language, ministries, a program is a ministry. It's the only way to build a congregation. If there's nothing of interest to do, folks will drift away and go somewhere else where there is something interesting to do. We donate to a vision, and only when we agree with the mandate of the organization. You created your vision and mission statement, not me. You did it with the help and under the expert guidance of some very talented UCE members. These are all your words and ideas. If you truly wish UCE to be something you are proud of that reflects your values, then I strongly encourage you to pledge so that the programming can thrive and grow. You know, if all you can pledge, I, I'm hearing you, I'm hearing all the voices because, you know, I have lived in, in some of my life where I was told, please give some money to the church, I would have said, I'd love to, but I can't. So if what you, all you can pledge is $5 a month, that's great. If you can double that and pledge $10 a month, that's awesome. You, at pledging $10 a month, could be single-handedly funding a budget line for an entire event or what, an, what a program or ministry needs for the whole year. Yay, you. It would be awesome. That's the end of part one. And so I would like, us to, in, I would like to invite us to sing hymn number 1058, Be Ours a Religion. I love this song, it's Theodore Parker, and I think it's a, it's a theological statement of who Unitarian Universalists are. I invite you to rise as you are willing and able and sing hymn number 1058, Be Ours a Religion. Let's, let's sing it through twice.
As we've heard, the theme for March services has been vulnerability. And as service leader, I've been invited to share a personal reflection on that theme, uh, what it means to me as a part of the UCE community. And I must say, <laughs> Reverend Rosemary and I did not coordinate <laughs> this ref my reflection and her message, but it's amazing how the, they fit together. It's sort of like unconscious collaboration. It's quite interesting, actually. So I am a member of the governance implementation team, GIT, as we may more fondly, I hope, <laughs> come to be known. Git spent a fair bit of time last year developing a vision, mission, and covenant with you as UCE members. And as Reverend Rosemary has read, vision and mission, the vision is our guiding star. The mission is the way we choose to stay on course. And the covenant gives us shelter when the weather gets rough. Without those things, we are more vulnerable to external and internal pressures and stresses, both personally and as an organization. For me, UCE is a safe place to live out my values when the world is just seeming more fraught with uncertainty and injustice. And I think it's worth supporting and working for a place that can welcome many others to find that sanctuary, to bring their joys and concerns, to rest in our connection. We can all be vulnerable in a safe place. I'd like to share a poem I read in, in the last CUC newsletter. These words are by Sharon Wiley. You are never alone. It is okay to be tired of change. It is okay to be tired of everything different. Okay to feel weary of resiliency and wholeness and learning and growth. And okay to yearn simply for rest. It's okay to be grouchy and unsatisfied and all the ordinary human ways of being that we are. Let our time together soothe what is restless in you. May you be comforted in knowing that whatever you are feeling today and other days, you are not alone. You are never alone. Yeah. Hymn number 1037, I read the words, and there is a reprise, a refrain, we forgive ourselves and each other, we begin again in love, and remain seated, if we could bring the lights down just a little bit. Karen, would you please just play through the refrain once for us? For remaining silent when a single voice would have made a difference. We believe ourselves and each other. We begin again. In. For each time that our fears have made us rigid and inaccessible. For each time we have struck out in anger without just cause. For each time that our greed has blinded us to the needs of others. For the 
selfishness that sets us apart and alone. For falling short of the admonitions of the Spirit. of our unity. For those and for so many acts, both evident and subtle, subtle which have fueled the illusion of separateness. I'd like to invite you into a time of contemplation, meditation, prayer, whatever it is that will feed your spirit, your soul. I invite you to relax into your chair, plant your feet on the ground if that is what you would like. The meditation this morning is going to go in a familiar way. We're going to focus in on our breath and how our bodies feel, getting ourselves grounded and centered. Then I'm going to read a poem. It's called The Healing Time by Pesha Gersler. I'll read it a couple of times with some silence in between. And after the second time of reading it, there'll be a small amount of silence and then we will sing together How Could Anyone, hymn number 1053, and you can remain seated for that as well. And so I invite you, always by invitation, to take a deep, long breath with me in and out. And a couple of more in your own time, in and out. Look for any spots as you do that in your body that may be holding tension and breathe into those. Are there spots of pain, anxiety? Does the air flow freely through your lungs? Is there a catch? Is there something that needs your attention, your loving healing attention. The Healing Time by Pesha Gertler. Finally on my way to yes, I bump into all the places where I said no to my life. All the untended wounds, the red and purple scars, those hieroglyphs of pain carved into my skin and bones, those coded messages that send me down the wrong street again and again, where I find them. The old wounds, the old misdirections, and I lift them one by one close to my heart, and I say, holy, holy. Finally, on my way to yes, I bump into all the places where I've said no to my life. All the untended wounds, the red and purple scars, those hieroglyphs of pain carved into my skin and my bones. 
those coded messages that send me down the wrong street again and again where I find them, the old wounds, the old misdirections, and I lift them one by one and close to my heart, and I say, holy, holy. Karen, could you please lead us into this song? How deeply you're connected to my soul. How could anyone ever fail to notice that you are anything less than beautiful? Those words touch my heart every time I see, sing them. Now we enter into a time of lighting candles of joy and concern. We bring our whole selves to this place. We bring our joys that we have wish to share with others, we bring the concerns and the hurts of our hearts. And sometimes, the lighting of a candle can make those joys seem even more joyful. And they can make our concerns seem a little less daunting. And so now, I invite you to come and light a candle of joy or concern or confusion or contemplation or perhaps even frustration and embarrassment. I invite you now to come and light a candle.
Lynn is going to go and light a, a candle for all those joys and concerns that we mean in our hearts, perhaps not even yet figured out, still causing us confusion. Thank you, Lynn. And then I'm going to suggest that I could just go home now because Lynn actually did the second part of the sermon already. <laughs> okay, well, you know, I've worked hours on this, so you're going to hear it. Kidding. So, I'd like to talk about something way more fun now than budgets and pledges. Let's talk about vulnerability. Oh, well, that might not be much fun either, right? <laughs> Being vulnerable means we set ourselves up for failure. Getting wounded and hurt by others. And hurting ourselves sometimes. Being vulnerable comes at a cost, as does not allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. You can't talk very long about vulnerability without bumping up against the work of Brene Brown. Her work has transformed my thinking and life. And I, if you haven't yet, I strongly encourage you to look her up. I think I've watched her TED Talks, all of them, more than ten times each. While she advocates to live our lives open, vulnerable, and wholeheartedly, she also makes it clear that you can't do it without safeguards. These safeguards are called boundaries. Boundaries, simply put, this is her definition, it's what is okay and not okay with you, and what is okay and not okay with me. Each of us gets to decide for ourselves exactly what is and is not okay for them. We have to be able to protect our hearts, our wounds as they heal, our minds and our bodies. She, has also, she is also clear that in her work she has discovered that the most compassionate people she has come across are also the most boundaried. Once we have established our boundaries, that is, deciding what is not and not okay, what is and what is not okay with us, then we can open our hearts to loving, compassion, and vulnerability. Imagine being compassionate, loving, kind, vulnerable, doing things for others, and doing these things when it's not okay with us. That's not going to work, is it? That is not sustainable. I'll say it again. If we wish to live the life of the wholehearted, being vulnerable in the world, we have to establish what is and is not okay with us. For each of us, this is different. And individually, we can set our boundaries one day here and then decide that the next day, oh, they can be way out there. They need to be clearer, closer, or expansive, depending on the day and where our heart is and where our energy is. It's our decision each and every day where we place our boundaries. And it's our job to do that. So why in the world would we want to be vulnerable anyway? Doesn't that just set us up for getting hurt, being taken advantage of, or the worst? in my humble opinion, getting embarrassed. I hate getting embarrassed. Well, the short answer is yes. Being vulnerable can be painful, just like everything in life can bring us pain. And we have to navigate these waters of vulnerability somehow. She used all my words. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> Are you my twin? No. I love it when that happens. Just love it. We have to navigate these waters individually 
and collectively. If boundaries are the way to allow ourselves to open up and live life with vulnerability, wholeheartedness, then living collectively while following our covenant can allow us to open up as a congregation. Boundaries let us say, I'm okay with this, and I'm not okay with that. For example, a person might decide to volunteer for an event. Someone says something to them that hurts their feelings. That person has a choice. They can decide they are not going to say anything, but they are hurt, feeling resentful. So they quietly stop volunteering and maybe even stop attending church. Another choice might be to talk to a third party or parties, and that can go badly. Triangulation or gossiping hurts the ministries of the church. I'll say that again. Triangulation hurts the ministries of the church. The best choice, of course, is to go directly to the person in question with or without support and bring up the issue in a clear manner. Our, com our covenant says, with love as our guide, we pledge to create a beloved community of peace and compassion. We trust our ability to work through conflict. As members and friends, we have agreed to honor and respect diversity, be truthful, kind, and open-minded, assume good intent and goodwill, listen with open hearts, and speak with care, even when it's uncomfortable. Talk to, not about, others. Accept responsibility. Address conflict properly, promptly, pardon me, and be steadfast in support of our community. Share the ministry of the congregation through our gifts of time, talent, and money, and express gratitude. There's a lot in these words. And a lot of those words are about learning to be together in community, to be safe, to great, have great collective boundaries, therefore allowing us together to be vulnerable. The most compassionate people are those with good boundaries, says Brene Brown. The reverse is also true. If we don't have good boundaries collectively, we can't together be compassionate and vulnerable. The research is clear. Living a life brings pain. Being in community brings pain. And yet, if we wish to live a, joy, live, live a life with joy, with a whole heart, we have to become vulnerable. What a paradox. So, what do we do if we wish to be in this community in a loving, compassionate, and joyful way? What can we do to discover the richness and satisfaction that living in a healthy community can bring? First of all, we set our personal boundaries. What is okay with me and not okay with me and with you. Then we decide living in a covenantal community is sometimes hard but it's so worth it. The boundaries inherent in our covenant is simply what is and is not okay with us collectively. I invite you into the richness and fullness of life that living with joy and compassion can bring. I invite you to open your hearts and minds to possibilities, to adventure, to new experience, to full participation in life. And this can only be accomplished by making ourselves vulnerable. And the way to become vulnerable, and the way, only way to be vulnerable safely, is to set boundaries. This seems to be a theme. Step by step, we are learning to be together in a more healthy way. We are learning that we need to live into our covenant. We are learning that we have something of great value here to share with the world. And, it, and we are learning that is only with an open heart and open hands that can, transformation can take place. 
how do you wish to be in relationship with UCE? Are you willing to do the work of setting your boundaries so that you can be here in a vulnerable state, open to the fullness and richness of life? Are you willing to create beloved community by taking our covenant to heart and engaging within these bounds as best you can? We all mess up from time to time. I certainly do. And then we talk about it with the right person or people. We make amends. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. And sometimes we can hug it out. So allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, to live life wholeheartedly, along with clear boundaries, is a sure recipe for a wor life worth living. Being alive makes us vulnerable. May we be open to the possibility that when we are safely vulnerable, joy and love will find us. May we be open to the possibility that when we are safely vulnerable, joy and love will find us. So may it be. Amen. So, together we are building a new way. One of my favorite hymns, 1017. The words will appear, please rise in body or spirit as you wish and sing together our closing hymn, to hymn number 1017. I'd like to invite Gerard forward, please, to extinguish the chalice while I read these closing words. They're by Wendell Berry. It may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work, and that when we no longer know which way to go, we have come to our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone that took part in this service, that contributed to it, tech team, those on Zoom, everyone here. So many hands go into creating our Sunday services. And I have a benediction for you. It's from the Talmud. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to, uh, to complete the work. 
but neither are you free to abandon it. So go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next Sunday. No. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm going to be, I have, I'm going to be at Westwood next Sunday. I'm so looking forward to being with our, with our, with the other congregation. And so Corey Alice will be here next Sunday. I'll see you Easter. Awesome. Okay, let's sing Carry the Flame.